Let me sing, mark it down. <laughs> Ain't going to happen. If you have your Bible, turn to John chapter number 20. John chapter 20. And when I was a kid, my English grammar teacher, we had some fine teachers at Rural High School. I love my teachers. They would rebuke us vehemently for using the word ain't. But I understand now it's in the dictionary. <laughs> so you just wear it out long enough and it becomes real, right? John chapter number 20 and verse number 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher, so they ran both together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher. He saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Father, bless your holy word now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now the first day of the week is Sunday. Always has been, always will be. It is the first day of the week. And the Lord said uh, through his apostles, he said, lay in store on the first day of the week. So the disciples met on the first day of the week. Christ arose on the first day of the week. And so the first day of the week has come to, has be, has come to be the day when the church of God, for the most part, meets on the first day of the week. But if you meet Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, that's fine too. There's not one thing wrong with choosing any day of the week that you desire to meet. Most of Christendom meets on Sunday. For the Bible tells us in the book of John chapter number 20, on the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher. The sepulcher, of course, is a term for a tomb. A tomb, a place where his body had been lain. His body was put in that tomb three days prior to what had happened here. The events prior to this Sunday morning, the Last Supper, the Passover had taken place, and the Lord had taken the Passover and had changed it in to the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He had been betrayed by Judas Iscariot sold for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a common slave. Then at Gethsemane, the Lord Jesus Christ had prayed, as it were, great drops of blood in crying out to the Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. But if you'll get home this afternoon, read he Hebrews chapter number five, and you'll find the writer of Hebrews take you deep. He'll take you very deep into the mind and heart of God the Father and God the Son as the redemption plan for mankind was being worked out. At Gethsemane, he was apprehended and taken into the court and there eventually was taken to the cross at Calvary where he was crucified between two thieves, one on the one hand and one on the other. The crucifixion is an historical event that took place in time on this earth exactly as the Word of God says that it did. The man Christ Jesus died on the cross. He did not swoon. The Passover plot likes to say, and there are others who have posed the theory that he did not literally die, that he simply swooned or passed out and they took his body down and laid it in a tomb or a cold place and it revived and then he lived on and got married and had children and blah, blah, and on and on it goes. You can find every kind of blasphemy imaginable as it relates to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is very clear. He died. 
And when he died upon the cross, they took his body down and laid it in a virgin tomb. Mary Magdalene, the last time that she saw him alive, he was hanging on the cross. She looked up at him and he undoubtedly had looked down at her and saw her faithfulness as she stood by the cross of Jesus. All the other disciples were gone except John the apostle. Now she comes to the tomb on Sunday morning early, the Bible tells us, as the sun was rising. She'd been possessed by seven demons. The Bible said she had accompanied the apostles in their ministry. In plainer words, she had gone with them where they went. And as they ministered the word of God, Mary Magdalene was right by their side. She had stood at the foot of the cross of Jesus with the mother of Jesus until the time came when the, he said to John, behold thy mother, behold thy son. And from that hour she left, he left with her, but Mary Magdalene stayed right there at the cross. <coughs> She heard him speak his last seven times from the cross at Calvary. To the thief on one side, he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. To God the Father, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To his mother, he said, Woman, behold thy son, and pointed out John the Apostle. His awful cry that came from the cross at Calvary, My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? From the cross he cried, I thirst. And my friend from the cross, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then finally he said, it is finished. It was done. It's consummated. It's brought to fruition. And nothing can be added whatsoever. She stood there at the cross. She felt the darkness. She felt the earthquake between, beneath her feet. And she felt the thickness of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ as he gave up the ghost that day at the cross at Calvary. She in the darkness heard the centurion as he said, truly this was the son of God. Mary Magdalene witnessed all of these things. If ever a first-hand witness to the crucifixion and the death of Christ, it was Mary Magdalene. She was with Joseph of Arimathea when he laid his body in the tomb, a brand new tomb. She was there right by his side. She sat down next to that tomb and thought and wept and prayed. There she stayed until completely exhausted. Mary Magdalene got up and went home. While all the others had already gone away, it was Mary sitting next to the tomb of Jesus, weeping and crying and contemplating what had just transpired before her eyes that day. But now it is the third day since the crucifixion, and she comes with spices to anoint his body. She was looking for his body. Keep that in mind. She was looking for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Her whole world laid in that tomb. Nothing else mattered. There was nowhere else to go on planet earth. Nothing was as important as her being at this tomb early this Sunday morning. If you wanted to find Mary Magdalene, find the tomb of Jesus. Mark it down. She would be there. And so my friend, she comes to the tomb looking for his body. He'd given her a reason for living. Something had come alive inside this woman when those seven demons had left her body. It was by the power of Almighty God. And she never forgave and for, for, she never forgot the one who had delivered her from the hell that she was living in. You see, my friend, you can't live somebody else's hell. You can't feel what they feel. You can't go what they, through what they go through. Only God God Almighty can feel what goes on inside your soul. And when you are delivered from the power of hell, you know what it is to have a burden lifted from your soul. And you know what it is to have peace and forgiveness flood your heart. The Bible said to whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. Nobody would ever doubt the love of Mary Magdalene for our Lord Jesus Christ. Every perverted mind that ever lived on the face of this earth has somehow or another tried to attack Mary Magdalene and create some kind of a relationship between her and our Lord Jesus Christ that is not scriptural. That came from hell. It was born and bred in hell and that's where it will wind up. Make no mistake about it. Her relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ was completely and absolutely based upon a savior and a sinner that had been saved and had been cleansed and forgiven by the power of almighty God. And so Mary Magdalene came looking for his body. My friends, she came to a 
anoint his body. She had her spices, but when she arrived at the tomb, there was no body to be found. She runs to tell the disciples. She's alerted. She's hysterical. She's come for the body of Christ to anoint it. And it's not there. The tomb was open. His body was gone. And she runs to tell Peter. And she wants him to know what had happened. He's not there. He's gone. And as far as she was concerned, someone had stolen the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so they return to the tomb. They come back to the tomb. They come back to where she had already been earlier that morning. She tells the disciples and Peter and John with her run back to the tomb. John outruns Peter. John comes to the tomb first. But John is not Peter. He came to the door. He looked in and that was good enough for him. Not so Peter. When Peter arrived at that door, he said, move over, son. I'm going in. And he went right into that tomb and he walked right right into the place where the dead had laid. Here was a man who lived by his emotions. He lived by his heart. He lived by what he felt. He lived by what he was. No put on, no show. What you see is what you get. When his faith failed him, it failed him. But when he stood, he stood. When he preached, he preached. And my friend, this apostle, this apostle of the Lamb said, I got to find out for myself. Your word's not good enough. And into the tomb he went nowhere to be found because the tomb was empty. So somebody had carried his body away. Peter and John left that day. They went back to their home. They left the tomb. Nobody, nowhere, no one. What are we going to do? So they go back to tell the other apostles that his body is gone. But Mary Magdalene, true to her character, has nowhere else to go. She stays at the tomb. There's nowhere else to go. As she sat by that tomb with his body inside, with a stone in front of it where it sealed it, she sat by the tomb this time. She had nowhere else to go. And this, my friend, is where we pick up our story. She had come for a body. She came with the disciples and the body was gone. She looks about and she sees one who's supposed to be to her the gardener. She says this must be the gardener and the, and the one that is supposed to be the gardener says to her woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? The questions of the Lord Jesus Christ are always piercing questions. They always reach to the heart of the soul. The the answer sometimes is far greater than comes forth from the mouth of a human being. The answer can only come forth from the heart. He pulls out of the soul the answer. He said, who are you looking for? Who are you looking for today? Are you looking for money? Are you looking for prosperity? Are you looking for advancement in society? Are you looking to better yourself? Is that all you got on your mind? What are you looking for? Do you really want to know the truth? Are you concerned about that? Are you really interested? Have you really taken time to check into these things that this preacher is preaching about this morning? Number one, there was a man that lived 2,000 years ago. There's ample secular evidence outside the Bible that attest to the fact that he lived. There is no doubt whatsoever that he lived. None, my dear friend. And number two, this man that lived 2,000 years ago, he went to a cross and he died. And on that cross he died. And that, or that we find in secular evidence also that he was crucified. One Christus he's called was crucified, a Jew. And it's in secular history. And then number three, my friend, something happened in that first century that turned Jerusalem upside down. It changed the lives of countless thousands, tens of thousands of people. And to this very day, his cross is preached. His name is glorified. And the power of the Holy Ghost is in this world. You're looking at some of the sorriest garbage that ever walked the face of this earth that have been born again. They're not what they used to be. That's what the church of God is about. It's about Mary Magdalene repeated time and time and time again. Here was a woman that had seven devils cast out of her but she wasn't the same anymore it's not about your religion it's not about your righteousness it's not about how good you are it's about the man Christ Jesus who bore your sin in his body on the tree and she knew who he was she knew all about him because he changed her life 
and she was at the tomb. Peter and John were gone, but Mary Magdalene was still there. She was talking to a man now she thought was the gardener. I want you to notice this is very important to understand the concept of this. She was talking to a man that she thought was the gardener. She looked at him. She talked to him. She comprehended him be a physical human being. And then my friend, he asked her a question, piercing to her heart and to her soul. But the question didn't tell her who he was. The question didn't awaken her heart. It did not tell her who he was. It takes God and God alone to let you know who he is. You got to find out who he is. I saw a thing the other day that had Mohammed. It had Jesus. It had Buddha. It had Confucius. It had some of our modern leaders and they were all named together and it offended me like you wouldn't believe. His name is never mentioned with anybody else's name. There's just one Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Lord God Almighty. My name belongs under his name and so does yours. Everything that's ever drawn breath on this earth is a creature. He's the creator. Bless his name forever. Notice what happens here in this garden. Here we have a human being, a creature, coming face to face with her maker. She said, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. He didn't come to deceive. He didn't come to play games with her. He didn't come to carry on some kind of a dialogue about religion. And then he says, Mary. That's all it took. Verse number 16, John 20, he said, Mary, just Mary. Nobody could say Mary like he could say Mary. Nobody could say my name like he can say my name. Nobody knows me like he knows me. There's something about your relationship with God that gets down to a personal level. You don't have a relationship with God by believing a catechism or theology or church membership or something some man's taught you. Your relationship relationship with God is built absolutely, completely, and entirely upon a personal understanding of who he is and who you are as you relate to him. Mary, he said. Oh, Mary, that got her attention because when he said, Mary, Bible said, my sheep know my voice and a stranger they'll not hear. You see, he'd already talked to her before that, but he hadn't talked to her heart like he was then. He identified her. He told her who she was. You, I know who you are in other words I know where you came from Mary I was the one there when the seven devils left you I was the one there when you had joy and peace in your soul Mary I'm the one that you followed around for three and a half years Mary Mary boy did she ever respond to that my lord Rabboni she called him mastering God there in that garden is the first worship service my friend when somebody worships God they fall on her face and she she takes hold of him and she blesses his holy name because of who he is. Nobody's singing hymns. Nobody gathered together. The church of God is just a small infinitesimal thing. But here we have one woman. Yes. One woman who had heard from heaven. I want you to notice a few things about what went on here. Some still search for him in the tombs. Did you know that? They're still looking for him in the tombs. Do you know why? Because they build monuments. They build buildings. They start movements. They create this. They create that. And you can always go find it and find that. And it passes from generation to generation to generation. And you think God's in that. Folks, God's not in your stone. He's not in your buildings. This thing could blow away by a hurricane or a tornado at any time. Look what happens every year in a country. Our churches are reduced to a pile of rubble. God's not interested in this building. He's interested in the people in this building. You don't find him in buildings. You don't find him in stone. You don't find him in mortar. You don't find him. Where do you find him, preacher? You don't find him. He'll find you. I want you to notice the second thing. He must open the eyes to see him. The eye of the soul to be able to see him for who he is. Who is he? They taught me until I was 27 years old about who Jesus was. Oh, he's the creator. He's the savior. He did this. He did that. That's all fine. But the fact of the matter, these are only things about him. They're not him. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not about him that you need him. It's who he is that you need him. 
There are people that get up in Bible colleges every day and they can give you a long theological dissertation about the Christology and about who Christ is and the, and the Christ and this and that and blah, 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 blah. But they don't know him. They don't know him. It's not what's about him. It's who he is. I want you to notice the third thing. I want you to notice the third thing. A tomb is fixed in location. It is fixed somewhere. You can always go find it. You can always go find the tomb. I can go to Jerusalem. I've been to that one over there now five, six times. I've been inside of it. It's called the garden tomb. Outside's an Arab bus station. Here you have what's called Golgotha. You have a, a skull, and it looks like a skull. A General Charles Gordon, a British general in the late 1800s, early 1900s, saw that. And he said that that, we called it to this day, Gordon's Calvary. And he said, this must have been the crucifixion place of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's probably right. I, have, I tend to believe that the garden tomb is the, is the location where Christ was crucified. For there's a huge cistern underneath it, a huge place to gather water to feed a huge garden. And there's a, there's a first century tomb right there. And then right next to it is this rock formation that looks like a skull. All of these places, all of this is in a very close proximity to each other. And my friend, every time I've been there, I'm impressed with the fact that this is something that is unique. There's not another place like it in all of Jerusalem. So it's there. But you see, you go to that tomb, and the tomb's empty. You go to the tomb, there's nothing inside the tomb. If, I went, if my faith was about the tomb, I wouldn't have any faith. Because I could always go find some monument or some tomb. It's not about that. So what's it about? It's about the fact that I can't go to a place and find him. That's what makes it so good. I can't go to a tomb and say, well, here he is. Come over here and I'm going to show you where he is. No, he's not there. Amen. If I could say, well, now, preacher, I've got a monument. I can take you to that monument and there I can introduce you to Christ. Forget your monument. The earth may shake tomorrow and swallow that thing up and you'll never see it again. We don't need monuments. We don't need tombs. We don't need any edifice fixed on this earth. What we need is a living Savior. And if you notice when she went to the tomb, she went to find a dead body and found a living Christ. She went to find a dead body and a living Christ made, herself known, made himself known to her. He came to her. It was after she had exhausted her mental ability and had, was at the end of herself. And, and Lord, where's his body? What happened to him? Then he said, Mary... Let me say something to you this morning I think will help some of you. Salvation has been reduced to a formula in the church, especially Baptist, especially independent fundamental Baptist. Some soul winner got you down the altar and he read off a prayer to you. You prayed the sinner's prayer. You're up and you're born again for the rest of your life and you live like hell until you die. Some of the biggest Baptist preachers in this country are rotting in prison right now. And that's no joke. And I pray for them. It's not a joke to me. It's serious business when you think about a man pastoring a huge Baptist church that's in there right now for molesting a 14 or a 15 year old girl. That's not a joke. You understand that salvation is not a formula. It's not a sinner's prayer. It's not a catechism. It's not baby sprinkling. It's a mystery. Some of you have been to the altar 15 times and you still don't have anything. Some of you have been baptized two or three times and you still have nothing. And you're so frustrated you're saying to yourself, there's nothing in this because I've tried Jesus and he didn't work for me. And you didn't try him. You tried the system. Somebody assured you everything was okay. I've heard men get down in the altar and I've heard them say next to somebody, now you ask God to save you. You get up from here and you go out here and you stand on that because God cannot lie and you're calling God a liar if you're not saved. Oh, really? Who put you in the place of God? Some of you don't realize the darkness you've got to come through. Some of you don't realize the doors that have to be opened for you. Some of you don't realize the coldness and the, coldness and the hardness of your heart and the hell that's been built up in your soul in order for you to come to Christ. Some of you come to Christ in stages. You don't get saved in stages, but you come to him in stages. You have to come to him the way he draws you, and he has to draw you to himself out of yourself. Salvation is a mysterious thing, but once it happens, it's for real. 
Once you're really born again, you'll shout it for the rest of your life. Once you really get it, once you really get it, you want everybody else to know about it. It doesn't make any difference if anybody else believes. It doesn't matter. You know what happened to you. And the first thing that rises up in your soul is righteous indignation when you see the fakery. The cheap fakery that goes on at salvation today, especially in the fundamental independent Baptist churches. Cheap fakery just to put a number on a wall back here and brag to your little clique about what a great soul winner you are. There's only one soul winner. That's the Holy Ghost. We're vessels to be used in his hands. I've been witnessing to people about their salvation for 30 years. And some of them I've never said a word to, but I'm witnessing to them because they're watching me. You've been blabbering and running your mouth and you know all of the stuff to say to get somebody saved and then you're living like hell in front of them. You blabber on and blabber on and you quote scripture and you think everything's hunky-dory because you can quote scripture. The devil quotes scripture. There are people that don't buy it, folks. They don't buy into this garbage that quickly. They want to see something real. And I am firmly convinced that the eternal salvation God gives us is as real as anything can be real. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So am I against soul winning? No, I'm all for it. I'm against a man-made piece of garbage that bolts, that does nothing in the world more than parade the flesh and give people a false hope. How many people have I had say to me, well, preacher, I know they got saved in Bible school when they were seven. And they've been away from the Lord now for about 40 years and they just don't have any, they don't have any fellowship. They're backslidden. That's the big Achilles heel of the independent fundamental Baptist church. What's that? Backslide. Backslide. Do you know what backslide doesn't belong in the New Testament? Did you know that's not a New Testament term? Do you realize that? And the one place you find it in the Old Testament, it's a heifer. A heifer. And I ain't calling you a heifer. It's a heifer climbing up a hill. And because she's a little heavy and the ground must be loose, she gets so far and then what happens? Starts sliding back. That's what it's talking about. Your salvation is not you climbing up a hill. If you're in Christ, there's a new creature. Well, say, preacher, you're preaching perfection. No, I'm preaching a change. If your salvation is real, if it's real, if it's really real, people will observe the change that's taking place in your life. People do not expect you to be perfect. If somebody expects you to be perfect, you're dealing with a fool. Why do you expect them to be perfect when you're not perfect, son? There are no perfect people on this earth. But when you're dealing with a sincere soul that is genuine in their faith in Christ, you're going to see them fall, sure, get knocked down, sure, stomped while they're down, yes, kicked while they're down, yes. But you'll watch them rise up again. You'll watch them reach up and take hold of the one that they believe in and trust. They'll watch the, you'll watch them rise up and you'll see their faith come alive again and you'll see them walking closer to the Lord the next time. They got knocked down, yes, but they're back up again. They come back to him. They love him and they say, Lord, help me. I failed you. I missed the mark, but I want to come back because there's something in your heart that cannot leave you. My sheep know my voice and I chastened them. So salvation is a mystery. You mean I can be saved and not know it? Oh, no, 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 no. The mystery doesn't have anything to do with who died for you, why he died for you, the fact that he rose again, that he's coming again, all that's not a mystery. The mystery is how you come to him. That's a mystery. I don't think there's another person in this building that got saved just like I did. I don't believe so. I don't think so. But you all came to the same Savior and the same blood washed your sins away. And you are all born of the same Spirit. 
And now we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Hallelujah to God. Mary Magdalene, she had seven devils cast out of her. I don't know how many got cast out of me when I got saved. I don't know how many followed me around for the last 27 years. I every once in a while pick one up. I found out if I study the Bible and begin to get off into witchcraft and demonism and all this stuff going on today so I get up and teach you, I find they start harassing me. They're very vain, these creatures are. It's a real world. What do you do? I get on my face and I say, Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood against you. Leave me. And you know what happens? They leave me. They leave me. They leave me. It was a mystery that brought me to Christ. But I'll tell you one thing. He brought me there. And I'm going to live whatever time I have left on this earth for him. I want my life to count for him. And I hope before I leave this world, if I leave this world before you do, before the Lord Jesus comes back, with all of my heart, my strongest desire in my soul is I watched him. I listened to him. I know all about him. He's got his problems, but he was real. If you can say that about me, I wouldn't ask for anything better than that. Nothing. Nothing. That's the greatest thing you could say for this preacher. Father, in Jesus' name, and for thy sake I pray that you glorify yourself. In thy holy name I ask it. Amen. Let's stand up in here this morning.